I wanna know ya Cameron, Guinea-Bissau, Sierra Leone Gotta let me show ya We remember and honor the resilience of the 110 people who after being kidnapped from West Africa in 1860 and illegally brought to Mobile, Alabama aboard the Clotilda, went on to care for each other, raise children, purchase land, start businesses, vote, and collectively establish the historic community of Africatown and several long-standing community institutions such as the Union Missionary Baptist Church. We also recognize and appreciate their descendants who continue to preserve and perpetuate their culture, heritage, and African ancestry. I'm Bernetta Henson. I'm a fifth generation descendant of Polly and Rose Allen, who both came over on the slave ship Clotilda. I was reared by my grandparents. They were they were brought up in Africa Town. My grandmother is the great is the granddaughter of Polly Allen, and she left a rich heritage with me. I was with her from the time I was maybe six months old until I got married at twenty years old. I have been married for fifty one years. We have two children and three grandchildren, and we're just everyday people. My name is Jeremy Ellis. I'm a sixth generation descendant of Holy Allen, whose African name is Kupoli, and Rose Allen, who were shipmates on the Clotilda. The finding of the Clotilda is a critical piece of the story of Africa Town, which was built by the resilient descendants of America's last slave ship, thought to have been burned and scuttled by its captain in the 1800s, the Alabama Historical Commission announced that the wreckage of the Clotilda had been found on May 22, 2019, after a blizzard had left parts of a wreck visible above the mud a few miles from Mobile. All of the, the talk about the finding of the Clotilda and us changing the narrative from the ship to the 110 enslaved Africans that were on the Clotilda, because essentially it's really about them and their resilience, which is why I've really tried to push changing the narrative from the ship to more about the individual. So whenever I talk about this story, I want to make certain that we're clear that Polly Allen and Rose Allen who are my direct lineage were, were and their resilience, um, those Africans being able to, um, to develop a community called Africa Town. And, the, and let me even take a step back because I get really passionate about this. July 9th, 1860, we know that they arrived to, 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 um, to the Mobile area, Plateau area. In 1863, Emancipation Proclamation, 1865, um, they learned of their freedom. 1868, they became citizens. Holy Allen, along with three other of his um, shipmates, went down to the Mobile um, Court, became um, um, citizens of the U.S. And also in 1868, we know that they founded Africa Town. 1870, we know that they started to purchase land. And Holy Allen, um, my ancestors, um, he purchased. Um, in 1872, two acres of land. Um, 1874, he voted for the first time. Now, why do I why do I tell you all this? To go from being captured and brought to a foreign land, um, and then being able to um, purchase their own land and do all of the things that they did within that 10 year time frame, is really truly a resilient story and the story that needs to be told. It's not about the ship. It's not about the mere family. It's not about Captain Foster. It's about the resilience of these 110 people that, that were captured. And what we do know is that even though 110 were, 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 were brought here, one of those passed away during that journey. So for me, 
It's about the people and making certain that we keep their legacy alive and we talk about what they were able to accomplish. The Clotilda is the last documented slave ship to reach North America on July 9, 1860. Even though the U.S. had banned the importation of enslaved Africans 52 years before the arrival of the Clotilda, unlawful Alabama plantation owners risked illegal slave runs to Africa to exploit free labor for the booming cotton trade. The Clotilda arrived in Mobile Bay in Alabama, carrying 110 African men and women and children who were kidnapped from present-day Benin, Atacora, and Ghana. They were of the Yoruba, Nupe, and Dendi tribes. Ridoshi, slave named Sally Smith, one of the captives of the Clotilda who died in 1937, was long thought to have been the last survivor of the Clotilda. Further research published in 2020 indicated that another survivor, Matilda McCreer, lived until 1940. They survived and it was because they had a desire to do what was better. They never relinquished and said, oh, this is the best that we can do. We can't do any better. We're just going to settle for this. They were very innovative, very strong-willed people, and with a strong determination to make things better for the next generation. In March of 1984, nine descendants of those original 110 African men and women and children filed paperwork with the state of Alabama to register as the Africatown direct descendants of the Clotilda Incorporated. The Clotilda Descendants Association is one of many groups working to preserve the historical significance of Africatown. Africatown is an all-black, independent settlement founded in 1876 by enslaved Africans who arrived in America on the Clotilda. The Africans from the Clotilda could not be legally registered as slaves because they were smuggled in. However, they were still treated as chattel, a legal term for property. Kujo Kazula Lewis was a chief and the oldest enslaved African on the Clotilda and founded Africatown with 31 other former slaves after the Civil War. They were joined by other continental Africans and formed a community that continued to practice many of their West African traditions and Yoruba language for decades. In the late 1950s, Africatown adopted community rules based on mostly Tarkbar tribal customs and chose leaders maintaining the use of their Yoruba language and cultural traditions. Poli Allen and Rose Allen were two of the 110 Africans who arrived on the Clotilda and both helped establish the Union Missionary Baptist Church of Africatown. Prior to the finding of the Clotilda um, and the different organizations that are available today uh, or that are telling this story, um, in the early 70s, and um, there were other organizations that were keeping this story alive. Um, one of those organizations, which was started in 1984, was the Africa Town Direct Descendants of the Clotilda. That organization was founded in, in 1984. And my grandmother, Beatrice Ellis, was, was the president of that organization. Um, Theodore Arthur, who is a cousin of mine, also was the vice president, and Mary Pogue and, and Paul Pogue um, were other officers. Israel Lewis, Ms. Henson, Ms. Hill, all of those individuals um, were kind of keep trying to do what they could to keep this story going. And my grandmother, Beatrice Ellis, was, was one of the frontline people of, of that organization. And, of keeping this story alive, and that's how I became involved. Even growing up as a as a um, as a young person, I had no idea the relevance of this story. Right? It it really didn't hit me, or really was I didn't really know until um, I went off to college and 
my friends who were from Selma, Alabama, were talking about um, their history and their story was when it really started to click for me as a young person that, wow, I'm a descendant. Interest in Africatown has been on the rise since Clotilde survivor Cujo Lewis's story was subject of bestseller Barracoon by Zora Neale Hurston. As the story is told, I want us to always remember that our ancestors were the bridge that brought us over. We never want that bridge to fall down. We want that bridge to continue to be the groundwork that propels us into the future, into future generations. We want our children and grandchildren to learn from what we have learned and to pass it on to their children. I've taken, in regards to my daughter, um, who Zora, um, who is named after Zora Neale Hurston, um, who wrote the Barracoon um, book that talks about her interview with um, Kujo Lewis, one of the enslaved Africans on the ship. Uh, my daughter's middle name is Beat, uh, B, uh, which is short for Beatrice, my grandmother that I just told you all about. Um, but I've taken an active role in making it a priority that Zora grows up knowing her history, knowing this story, um, knowing about her two, um, her seven, she'd be set, she would be a seventh generation descendant of Holy Allen and Rose Allen, who were um, enslaved Africans on the Clotilda. So making certain that she's aware of not only her direct lineage to that ship, but understanding the role that they play as individuals. Um, and then seeing her dad being active. And as one of the elders, so to speak, I am very pleased that he's on board and moving forward and keeping the story told. A lot of people don't even know that Holy Allen and his wife Rose were one of the founders of the church, Union Baptist that stands today. And we forget about how important their spiritual relationship was with each other and with God. And I just do want to appreciate Jeremy for staying with the story and making sure that Every piece of our integrity, our stamina, our personalities are brought out there in a way that would be pleasing to our ancestors. We were not uh, animalistic people the way they portray us. A lot of times I've seen people kind of mimicking Africans in their life. They're climbing trees, they're monkeys. We're very, very educated people. And the education came not only from schools and from books, but from our families and the way that they taught us how to survive. If they not given us good direction in survival skills, we would not have made it. Listed as an historic district on the National Record of Historic Places today, Africatown is still flourishing with some 100 descendants of the Clotilde's residents designated by the UNESCO Slave Root Project as a site of memory, Resistance Liberty Heritage in 2018, Africatown has a legacy of survival and cultural preservation, solidifying its significance in world history. It has given us a desire to move forward and to be comfortable with who we are and to always reach higher. We thought that knowing our history was something that everybody knew. We didn't know that everybody wasn't privy to that information. And I say that to say that, that on a daily, weekly, whatever basis, we were reminded of where we came from, more importantly, as to where we were going.
imagine coming to a foreign land, not being able to speak the language, but knowing that you wanted to be a citizen and understanding the power to vote. So we thought we're, we're in an election season now. And in 1874, we know that Paul Lee Allen, along with two other of his um, shipmates, they went down to try to cast a vote. Well, they were disenfranchised when they initially tried to cast that first vote. Um, they went to their first polling location. Um, Timothy Mayer, who um, was actually their slave owner um, when they um, um, when they when they got here, he was on a horseback, and he basically said, "These are not U.S. citizens; they're Africans. They can't vote." He beat them to the poll, even though in 1868 they had became citizens. So they walked um, what is equivalent to another five or ten miles to go to another um, polling location to cast the vote, only to be met by Timothy Mayer again. Timothy Mayer was there on horseback. He told the poll watchers and the poll folks, these are Africans, they're not citizens, they can't vote. Those, um, those three gentlemen were determined to cast the vote. So they ended up walking another five or 10 miles to their, to their third polling location. When they got there, Timothy Mayer wasn't there this time, but then they were asked that they needed to pay a dollar in order to vote. Well, at that time, a dollar was a full day's work. So for them, they understood the power and the importance of voting. They paid the dollar, which was a full day's work, and they cast their first, they cast their first um, ballot, they cast their uh, vote for the first time. And so those are the stories that, that, were, that are not being told to be able to understand the power of their vote and to do everything that they could to vote. To me, that's inspirational, um, knowing that they were overcomers and able to, um, to accomplish what they, what they have accomplished. And even for their legacy to still be alive today, um, it inspires me. I hope it inspires other. And it just speaks about us as Black people and, um, and, the, and the resilience we have within us. My grandmother, Ora Floyd, who was the daughter of Julia, Julia was the daughter of Polly. She always told me that Polly Allen never allowed himself to be uh, spoken of as a token of Timothy Mayer. He always said that that was his sponsor. That wasn't his slave master or anything like that. That was his sponsor. And that's the way he left it. She had a lot of dignity, and apparently she got it from Polly Allen. They had a lot of things about them that they maintained a certain dignity in the neighborhood. And one of them was that, no, I'm not a slave. I never was a slave. I was brought over here because they were brought from people, but they weren't slaves. And some of them were brought from Black people, but he never allowed himself to be called a slave. He always said Timothy Mayer was his sponsor. It's, it, this story is one that literally speaks to the resilience of the people and and it should be an inspirational for all. One thing I want to leave you with, as a descendant, you're never at a loss for an extended family. We welcome everybody. We accept you, we take you, we make you a part of us. We make you comfortable. African Ancestry is honored to remember who we are through the legacy and resilience of the descendants of the Clotilda and Africatown.